distinguished members of the fourth estate, colleagues from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, good morning. I am delighted uh, to welcome you to this second briefing session of the Cabinet Secretary for Foreign Affairs on the state of our diplomacy. I thank each and every one of you for honoring our invitation and for turning up on a cold July morning. As a progressive, open, and democratic nation, we are always attuned to the dynamics of global and regional geopolitics that define the state of our diplomacy. My briefing today will attempt to respond to three key geopolitical questions that influence our foreign policy. First, how are Kenya's relations with other countries given the rapidly evolving geopolitical balance of power? The second set of issues I'll be looking at is, as a thought and demonstrative leader, how do we, as Kenya, strengthen Africa's value preposition in addressing security and other cross-cutting development challenges? And thirdly, how is and will Kenya, a democratic sovereign country, at the heart of a fragile Horn of Africa and volatile Great Lakes region, continue to leverage its posture for regional stability and to secure its development trajectory, particularly in the light of the Big Four. As I have indicated before, our diplomacy seeks the pursuit, the promotion, and the protection of our unique identity, of our national interest and aspirations, and our sovereignty from the inevitable influences, sometimes foreign, while we seek to build and to consolidate our competitive advantage in the world. In this regard, we have in the last three months sought to expand opportunities for Kenya and to mitigate the, the risks that confront us. In a dynamic, fast evolving and complex world, our foreign policy has always been guided by key principles that anchor the pillars of our diplomacy. First, Kenya has to be successful and vibrant, and hence our aspiration to become a competitive nation. Second, Kenya must preserve the ability to make independent sovereign decisions based on our own national interests. Third, Kenya aims to be a friend to all. We do not wish to be forced to choose sides or to be caught in proxy battles. Fourth, we promote and believe in a global rule-based order within the framework of international laws and norms. Fifth, Kenya must be a reliable, a credible, and a consistent partner. We do not have the luxury of flip-flopping and changing our views for the immediate convenience. Purposeful application of these principles, guided by the Ministry's articulation of foreign policy over the last quarter, should form the basis of the measurement for, of our performance. Looking back at the last month, three months since March the 8th, when I met with you, I can confidently confirm that the state of our diplomacy and our standing among the community of nation is sound. We continue to deepen our bilateral relations through enhanced engagement at the technical and the highest political and diplomatic levels. We are playing our rightful place in participating in and driving regional and global agenda within the various multilateral fora. We are offering leadership on matters of global concern, and we are strengthening our management and operational systems at headquarters in order to support this foreign policy. Let me now illustrate our performance in each of these four areas in the last three months since March of this year. Is it three or four? My count sometimes can be a bit tricky. On deepening bilateral relations, in the period under review, particular focus 
has been on sharing information and clarifying the constitutive elements of the Big Four agenda of President Kenyatta, namely low cost housing, food security, universal health care, and manufacturing. Significantly, a number of memorandums of understanding and frameworks of engagement have been concluded and signed between Kenya and a number of countries to give traction to the Big Four agenda. These engagements have been from the highest political level to the technical levels. So far, we have organized two successful outward state visits at the presidential level. We have received five inward bound high level visits by the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, the President of Djibouti, the Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore, the Chairperson of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, and from the US American Chamber of Commerce. On Cuba, the first state visit, which we, we had in March 2018, President Uhuru Kenyatta <coughs> has, from that visit, we have delivered now, in place, 100 Cuban medical experts that have already been deployed across the Kenyan public health facilities. 50 Kenyan postgraduate doctors will be trained in Cuba starting coming September. We have negotiated the development of preventative health curriculum for our medical schools, which is now underway, and as part of our preventive health strategy. And our two countries have concluded an agreement to collaborate in malaria vector control in the pharmaceutical sector, in biotechnology, and the research sectors. On food security and safety, an MOU between our ministries of agriculture was finalized and signed in April for cooperation in testing and performance of trial of biofertilizers in crop production, in field trials, and in commercialization of Cuba biorodent to reduce post-harvest losses, to increase urban agriculture, for field trials, and for use of Cuba tick vaccine. We are also working with Cuba for the improvement of aquaculture production and the quality through trials and piloting of the Cuban natural fish growth enhancer pro product, crop gem plasm exchange, for crops such as sweet potatoes, Irish potatoes, cashew nuts, rice and sugar cane, for fast maturity and increasing yields, and for small scale agro-processing, sugar production and value addition technologies. During that visit, also uh, there was a number of other memorandums that were signed, including on visa exemption, including on sports development, on cultural exchange, and between our National Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We then had a second state visit to Mozambique. You will remember the visit to Mozambique was themed from Lamu to Maputo, connecting the Swahili coast. But besides this historical and cultural linkage, the state visit of April 2018 led to an agreement to establish our diplomatic representation in Maputo uh, we led to a, it led also to an agreement for reciprocal waiving of visa requirements in order to enhance free movement of people between the two countries and also the signing of a bilateral trade agreement between the two countries. Most significantly was the agreement on the importation of the Mozambican coal for power generation in Kenya, opening opportunities for Kenyans investors in agriculture and the extractive sectors and drawing lessons from Mozambique on the blue economy. There was also agreement to cooperate on maritime matters within the framework of the Indian Ocean Realm. Among the agreements also signed was the promotion and protection of investments in both countries. During this period, as I've indicated, we have received a number of high-level visits. On the 6th of May, President Kenyatta received the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, His Excellency Habi Ahmed. Besides the regional security issues discussed and the reaffirmation of strengthening cooperation in search for regional peace and security, the President and the Prime Minister focused attention on deepening of our bilateral relations 
in areas of cross-border development, joint investment, particularly in the infrastructural sector within the framework of LAPSET and the Northern Corridor Development, energy connectivity, and investments in both countries. More importantly further, the two leaders re-emphasized re the need to revitalize the special status agreement and a rigorous review of its progress in terms of its implementation so that we can elevate our socio-economic uh, relationship to the level of security and defense cooperation. In this regard, there was agreement to finalize the kenya Ethio power transmission line. They also agreed to jointly supervise the Lamu, Garissa, Isiolo, Moyale road linkages, as well as the Moyale, Awasa, Addis Ababa artery. Ethiopia further undertook to acquire land in Lamu and to develop a logistics facilitation center in the light of the Lamu port. The need and urgency to intensify cooperation through joint investment in Moyale Joint City and the economic zone and the operationalization of the one-stop border in the next quarter. In order to, to contribute to interconnectivity of the continent, the two leaders directed the ministries of transport to engage in a discussion for closer cooperation between Kenya Airways and Ethiopian Airlines in order to drive the integration agenda through facilitating movement of goods and services as well as peoples across the continent. On the state visit to Djibouti, from Djibouti, President Gele paid his inaugural state visit to Kenya. During this visit, there was discussion and agreement on expansion of cooperation in various key sectors, primarily tourism through capacity building and tourism management exchanges. Five pacts were signed during this state visit, including cooperation in trade, bilateral cooperation in agriculture, cooperation in vocational training, and agreement on mutual visa exemption, as well as an agreement on reciprocal promotion and protection of investment. Then we had the visit by Honorable Wang Yang, the chairman of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which discussed ways to deepen our mutual cooperation in governance. This meeting reaffirmed the growing Kenya-China relations, uh, confirmed Kenya's participation in FOCAC, and agreed to increase the number of scholarships offered to Kenyan students and to negotiate, most importantly, guaranteed access of Kenyan goods into the Chinese market. We then received the American Chamber of Commerce of Kenya, the Kenyan chapter, and basically the discussion with the Chamber of Commerce was really the opportunities presented by the big four for investment by American entities. The president opened the American Chamber of Commerce of Kenya Economic Summit on the big four, and this summit sought to enhance U.S. private sector engagement on the big four. Gilbert Kaplan, U.S. Under Secretary of Commerce, led the U.S. business delegation to the event. And during this event, agreements worth over Kenya shillings 10 billion were signed in energy, housing, and support for the small and medium enterprises. Besides this high-level engagement, we also had political engagement that buttressed them at various levels. During this period, I, as the Cabinet uh, Secretary, received a total of 14 foreign ministers in Nairobi and held bilateral relations in both in Nairobi and elsewhere with a total of 25 foreign ministers from across Africa, Somalia, Egypt, South Sudan, Burundi, including this morning, South Africa, Namibia, Mozambique, Uganda, Tanzania, Djibouti. In Europe, I have met my counterparts from Ukraine, from the UK, from U the EU, from Portugal, in Austro-Asia, I have met my counterpart from New Zealand, Australia, China, Singapore, Sri Lanka. And from the Americas region, I have met my counterpart from the USA, as you will recall, who are probably the last people to host Taylorson. 
Uh, we met with Canada, I've met with Ecuador, and from the Middle East, I've met with counterparts from Jordan and Palestine. I have also, during this period, communicated with all of the 193 foreign ministers from across the world. In addition, the Chief Administrative Secretary has also undertaken a number of missions, including attending the WTO mini ministerial meeting that was held in New Delhi, representing the country in the high level revitalization forum on South Sudan and various rounds of shuttle diplomacy, as well as a number of investment and diaspora conferences, particularly in Botswana and South Africa. We have also held a number of political consultations in Brazil, in Mexico, and Israel. Besides this bilateral engagement, we have also been engaged, as I've indicated, at the regional level. At this level, we have remained focused on two key areas. Firstly, the promotion of regional integration, and secondly, the pursuit of peace and security. As far as regional integration is concerned, one of the most significant achievements is probably the 21st of March, when Kenya was one of the 44 African countries to sign on to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. On the 28th of March, Cabinet endorsed this FCFTA. We submitted it to Parliament and it got ratified. And the 10th of May, Kenya was the first, together with Ghana, to deposit its ratified instruments at the African Union. At the same time, we also ratified on the, the Tripartite Trade Agreement, TFTA, and we have also subsequently deposited it at the headquarters in Comesa. Both the CFTA and TFTA agreements open up the continent for free trade, for free movement of persons, and as well as goods and services. It is expected in all estimates, in very conservative estimates, that the CFTA, once it begins its implementation, should be able to grow the African trade from the small percentage of 15 to 25 percent in the next five years. Besides the CFTA, we've also engaged with the Northern Corridor. On the 26th of June, President Kenyatta hosted the 14th Northern Corridor Integration Summit in Nairobi. The summit was attended by Uganda, President Kaguta Museveni, President Kagame of Rwanda, Honorable Agri Tisa Sabuni, Presidential Advisor on Economic Affairs of South Sudan, with Burundi, Ethiopia, and Tanzania as observers. This Northern Corridor Summit urged the integration process for us to expedite the integration process within the East African community in order to grow the progress and to take advantage basically of the opportunities here, particularly in terms of infrastructural development, in terms of areas of geospatial data, in terms of valuation processes of the Northern Corridor Integration Project. The leaders further called for speedy implementation of ICT, power generation and transmission, interconnectivity, as well as human capacity building centers of excellence. Under the single customs territory regime, the summit directed partner states to implement harmonized measures that would ensure efficient clearance and movement of cargo from the port of Mombasa to enhance competitiveness and reduce the cost of air travel in the region. The heads of state also directed that liberalized multilateral air service agreements be quickly concluded and operationalized. We have also, within the region, been focusing on the question of peace and security. In the last three months, my ministry has continued to consolidate our commitment and participation in promoting peace and stability as a critical prerequisite for socioeconomic development for the entire region. In pursuing this objective, we continue to draw on Kenya's experience in mediation, in conflict resolution, and in peacekeeping. We have continued to participate and play our role as a member of the AU Peace and Security Council. To this end, we have engaged with a range of agendas. 
to enhance our geostrategic role in linking the sub-region and the United Nations agenda. In this regard, the Peace and Security Council also held a ministerial meeting on the 31st of May in Addis Ababa to discuss the Sahel region and the security and migration in Africa. We have, during this period also, under the auspices of EGAD, participated in the high-level revitalization pro, uh, forum for agreement on the resolution of conflict in South Sudan. We have convened a number of extraordinary sessions, both at the council and head of state level, during which a number of proposals have been placed before the, the, the parties in South Sudan. You will recall that the shuttle diplomacy had been ongoing and we are pleased to note that this has ended, ended in the face-to-face -face engagement of the two main parties, namely President Salva Kiir and uh, Dr. Riyak Machar. Currently, the negotiations following that face-to-face -face in Addis are ongoing in Khartoum, and it is expected that President Kenyatta will be briefed of these outcomes in order to see how to take this process forward. There has also been an extra uh, uh, 37th ordinary meeting of the Council of Ministers of the ESC in Arusha, which was in May. Kenya supports, it dur supported during this time, and we still do, the inter-Burundi dialogue under the mediation of President Yoweri Kakuta Museveni. Only this morning I met with my counterpart and had a full briefing on how far they have come. We know that Burundi has already had a referendum. We know they have defined the political path moving forward into 2020, and we are supportive of that initiative going forward. Day before yesterday, I returned from the 31st summit of the African Union, which was held in Nakusho to Mauritania. In attendance were 22 heads, heads of government, four prime ministers, and 20 foreign ministers. The theme of this uh, summit was critical. It was focusing on the combating of corruption. Besides dealing with strategies for dealing with corruption and impropriety across the AU organs, the summit adopted the 2019 budget, addressed the peace and security challenges as they relate to the Sahel, to Somalia, and to South Sudan, discussed the integration of the African continent and, and partnerships in the region, received a report of the progress on the CFTA, discussed the UN reform, reaffirming the African common position, Significantly, five countries, including South Africa and Sierra Leone, signed on to the CFTA, bringing the total signatures to 49 out of 54 countries. The Assembly also strongly urged member states to undertake the ratification processes within the shortest possible time. It is expected, we are hopeful, that by 2019, we can have the 22 ratifications that then uh, jump, jump start the implementation of the CFTA. I led on behalf of the President, the Kenyan delegation to the 31st AU Summit, and also participated on a side event on women in power, during which we spoke about the imperative of engendering the foreign policy across the world. At the international level, we have engaged robustly in the last three months. Between the 16th and 20th of April, President Kenyatta participated in the assembly of the Commonwealth Heads of State and Government in London. The summit agreed on ways to deepen trade in the 53 member state organization, enhance security, tackle climate change, and how to make concerted effort to leverage synergies particularly to deal with global challenges, including global warming. During the summit, Kenya won the support of the Commonwealth to host the Sustainable Blue Economy Conference in November later this year. On the sidelines of Chogam, the president also visited and witnessed the signing of a memorandum of understanding between the London the Stock Exchange and the Nairobi Securities Exchange, which is the securities one. I think London Stock Exchange and Nairobi Securities Exchange. He witnessed that. We saw him. He rang the bell at, this, at the Stock Exchange. He met with big captains of business, 
discussed a lot of uh, investment opportunities in Kenya relating to the big four, but most importantly also had his first uh, uh, lecture at Chatham House, uh, which was dealing with the place of Africa in the world today and in the future. But besides these engagements on the sidelines of the Chogam, the president also held bilateral consultations with a number of leaders of the world, including Prime Minister May, Justin Trudy, as well as um, uh, the, the Prime Minister of Pakistan. During this summit also, we came out having been elected as the chair of the Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group for the next two years. The president then attended on the invitation of uh, Prime Minister Trudy, the, the G7 summit in Quebec in June on 8th and 9th. During this summit, the leaders focused in the outreach session on ways to combat the pollution of the oceans and how to conserve environmental, uh, 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 in the environment and unlock the potential of the blue economy. During this summit, all the members of the G7 roundedly commended Kenya for the initiative on the Blue Economy Conference and expressed strong support for the uh, conference later in this year. On the margin of the Quebec summit, the president had occasion to hold bilateral sessions with President Kagame, President Cyril Ramaphosa, President Maki Sall, Andrew Holiness, Prime Minister of Jamaica, Prime Minister uh, uh, Christine Lagarde, Managing Director of the IMF, as well as uh, the head of the World Bank. Significant outcome from the engagement in, Cub in Quebec included the request to us to help host a Women of Africa conference in preparation for the Vancouver Women Deliver Conference of 2019. And we have actually, in follow-up to that, already held a number of consultations with the EAC, uh, the Economic Community Commission of Africa, as well as the AU on the modalities of holding these consultations. There was also an outcome relating to Kenya and Canada collaborating in a pilot project on refugee employment that provides for us access, guaranteed market access for the products that are produced by refugee labor in Canada. We also had discussions that led to the establishment of Kenya-Jamaica cooperation in bilateral air services agreement, as well as an agreement to establish a joint trade commission and cultural exchange and sports development with Jamaica. We were also, uh, there was also discussion with President Ramaphosa, which led to an agreement by the two leaders to host an Africa-led investment conference in Nairobi in October 2018. Roundedly, the President expressed invitations, extended invitations for the upcoming Blue Economy Conference, and these were received very well. We also had meetings with the MasterCard Foundation and you probably have read and reported about the willingness of MasterCard to actually put um, about uh, 300 million US dollars into uh, the vocational and technical training uh, in our country. We also had discussions around the Africa-Caribbean cooperation on post-Cotonou trade agreement. During this time, there has also been very engaged consultations on the ACP EU uh, agreement, but what is called the Post Cotonou Agreement. In May 27th to 30th, the 107th session of the Council of Ministers of the ACP and 48th ACP EU Ministerial Meeting was held in Togo to discuss the Post Cotonou Cooperation Framework between Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific countries and the EU after 2020. The benefits, experiences, and histories of linkages with these countries hold much for Kenya in positive lessons that can drive our development aspiration. It is with this in mind that Kenya intends to continue engaging 
within the structure of the ACP, although there is a lot of discussion now whether we should do ACP EU or whether we should do Africa EU. But our position in terms of uh, uh, policy and strategy is to retain the ACP framework in the negotiation of post Cotonou. But this is something that is evolving and it is something that we are very engaged in with our African, Caribbean, Pacific, as well as EU uh, friends. As I indicated earlier, there was the mini WTO ministerial meeting to reflect on the outcomes uh, from uh, Argentina because we all know that we did not get the outcomes we desired in those negotiations. We know that there have been uh, significant divergence of views between particularly the developed and developing countries, but it is our view that we should hold on the WTO framework and so Kenya will continue to engage with like-minded countries to make sure we do not fall off the rail of WTO. There has also been a lot of engagement with the Japanese private sector particularly, and we coordinated Kenya's participation in the Japan Africa Public Sector Forum that was held in South Africa in May. The forum addressed mechanisms of engagement between Africa and Japan, and Kenya had the opportunity to engage the Japanese authorities on deepening cooperation between our two countries, uh, Kenya, uh, our two countries. So far, 30 billion US dollars has been allocated to Africa's development as well as bankable investment projects with Japan for investment. And so we are hoping that part of this money can be leveraged again for the big four or for our development agenda. We have continued to provide our leadership in the global agenda. And in this instance, Kenya will be hosting the first global conference on the blue economy between the 26th and 28th of November in Nairobi. In our view, this conference presents a special opportunity to advance our shared priority, particularly in the implementation of Sustainable Development Goal 14, which is to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine ecosystem for sustainable development. Other core champions of the Blue Economy Conference are Belize, Sri Lanka, Vinyatu, and Fiji. But I have to indicate that Canada is co-sponsoring this conference with us and has been very, very engaged in the discussions on this and so far has actually given us substantial amounts of money, uh, two million US dollars, and $1 million in support for logistics uh, for the conference. The conference is part of the preparatory work to the 2020 Oceans Conference, which Kenya will be co-hosting with Portugal. The goal of the global blue economy is to have action-oriented discussions pertaining to sustainable blue economy strategy. For us as Kenya, and you will know, that within one of the sub-sectors in the manufacturing uh, agenda of the president is actually blue economy. Estimates and analysis that we have seen indicate that the proper, uh, 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 the proper utilization of our blue economy and the potential in our sea and rivers and lakes can actually boost our economy by more than a third in terms of the GDP it brings to us in the form of generating jobs, in the form of generating industries, in the form of securing food uh, security in terms of the value, the nutritional value that we get. We hope more Kenyans can eat fish, you know, and be more healthy. We are told uh, the reason uh, people from Western went to Makere, the most of them, is because they ate fish. So we are trying to get more people to go elsewhere, yeah? So even in terms of food, the nutritional value, to just get Kenyans to diversify. We need to diversify the economy, but we also need to diversify the food so that it, we do not have this situation continuing where when we don't have maize, there is famine. Eh? If there is no maize, there is famine. This is a problem. So I think blue economy gives us the potential to begin even to diversify our food sources to improve the nutritional value of them. And generally, this has a, 
uh, a, an effect in terms of creating a healthier population, a more productive population, and therefore a better Kenya, more competitive Kenya, and more prosperous Kenya. So we look forward and we hope that uh, the media, which I want to thank very much, because I think the briefings by the PS and the team that is led by Ambassador Gutu has, uh, has engaged with yourselves, and we have seen a lot of information going out in terms of dealing with blue economy. It is a new area, so many people don't understand uh, the elements of it. And I think we depend on the media to really get Kenyans engaged in this composition. There is potential out there, and we need to get involved in it. Finally, on expanding our diplomatic footprint. At home, and in order to support all these activities, the period under review has seen significant policy and administrative changes. As I previously pointed out, there is a growing demand for Kenya's leadership at the regional, continental, and even global level. And actually, my presentation in the last couple of minutes should demonstrate to you the growing demand for our leadership. We are called upon to provide not just thought leadership, but demonstrative leadership across many issues whether it is peace and security. It is interesting to know that it is some of the things we do that trigger action in certain areas. I can tell you without uh, fear of any contradiction, the triggering of the high level revitalization process in December came from activities that we were engaged in, you know, as a country. The discussion around whether we can have a face-to-face -face engagement of the protagonists in South Sudan came from here. Uh, the discussion, some of you will not know, the discussion that has led to the rapprochement between Eritrea and Ethiopia was mooted here. So there is a lot of demonstrative leadership out of Nairobi. And in order for us to continue providing this leadership in response to this reality, the cabinet on 15th of May approved the opening of 16 new diplomatic representations over the next three years. In Africa, we will be opening six full resident missions in Accra, Abidjan, Dakar, Djibouti, Maputo, and Rabat. Four consulates in Goma, Lagos, Arusha, and Cape Town, and two liaison offices in Kismayu and Argeisa. In Asia, we will open a resident mission in Jakarta and consulate in Mumbai and Guangzhou and Shanghai in China, respectively. We have also undertaken in the ministry, usually this is an internal administrative matter, but somehow in foreign affairs it, el it elicits a lot of interest. So we have done our deployment across the world, as you probably know, because some of you somehow uh, had uh, the lack of publishing internal documents. I don't know how you get them, you know, but in the interest of accountability, I hope one day I will know. <laughs> so we have done our deployment and we will continue to support our missions across the world so that they can deliver on what is a large, complex, but important agenda. In conclusion, dear friends, foreign policy is the sharp end of our national interest. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs has a distinct role to act as a bridge between our nation and the world to facilitate access to the necessary competencies to realize our big four and other national interests. The Ministry will continue to appraise you of the initiatives we are undertaking to secure the strategic interest of our nation as we articulate our foreign policy. As I conclude, I reiterate my commitment from the beginning of the readiness of this ministry to share information and to clarify any issue in our purview. In view of this commitment, the Chief Administrative uh, Secretary, Ababu Namwamba, the Principal Secretary, Masharia Kamau, the, the Political and Diplomatic Secretary, Tom Amolo here, and the Office of Public Relations with Jen here are available to engage with any one of you on any of these issues. I thank you for your kind attention.